This is CBC Here and Now. I used to be angry about it. I used to resent the world, resent society. Survivors of child exploitation break their silence. As a child, you cannot consent to any of what I went through. Well, you can score, but does he have what it takes to win the Tory leadership? I know exactly how the inner sanctum of government works. Going for gold, Liam Hickey scores first to send Canada into the Paralympic Hockey Finals. Well, tomorrow is Friday and overall it's shaping up to be a nice one as we start to head into Patty's Day weekend. I'll tell you what's in store coming up. Well, we start tonight with some good news, especially if you're a fan of Paralympian hockey star Liam Hickey. Hickey's played a key role in helping Team Canada win its division, and he did it again today in the semifinals. Laney with him, Hickey cutting in, shoot, scores! Canada breaks the ice, it's Liam Hickey, goes low, and it's 1-0 for the team in red. Now, Liam Hickey is quick. Canada didn't look back after that goal, and they beat the home ice favorite, South Korea, 7-0. So far, Hickey's racked up six goals and four assists. Hope he can keep it up in the gold medal game against the U.S. Both teams will put their perfect 4-0 records on the line this weekend. The game is 12.30 a.m. Sunday morning, island time. And hopefully it'll be worth staying up late to watch yet another Newfoundland and Labrador athlete go for gold. There are some big changes in store for the province's Family Violence Protection Act. And the province's justice minister believes it will remove a barrier that has prevented some victims of abuse in the past from receiving help. Andrew Parsons met with reporters today to say changes to the act will give judges broader powers when it comes to granting what's called emergency protection orders or EPOs. Judges will soon be able to remove an aggressive spouse from a home for up to 90 days if it's believed there is emotional, psychological or financial abuse going on. Currently, judges can only act if there's violence or harassment. Personally talked to people this year who are dealing with the situations where there's no physical violence, but there's other situations going on that are causing harm to them and their children and they have no way out of it. So again, that, I, that's all the justification that I need there. But I've been hearing about this from advocates, from survivors, from victims within the legal community. And again, this is not, this is not the last thing we're going to do. There's more. EPOs, as they're called, can also include restraining orders, seizure of weapons, and rulings on who can control personal property. They were already quite common. There were 270 applications for an emergency protection order by those in an intimate spousal relationship last year. 198 of them were approved. The Liberals say the new legislation will be passed during this sitting of the legislature. It was their first face-to-face -face debate, but there wasn't much disagreement between Tony Wakeham and Chess Crosby. Here now's Peter Cowan explains why. They were all smiles at the start of the debate and still smiling at the end. At times it seemed like the candidates were debating the governing Liberals, not each other. The Liberals are continually using rhetoric and scare tactics on the people of the party. The Liberal government has avoided tough decisions. It's a govern government which does not govern, in fact. Both candidates agree on the need to cut government spending. They agree that health care needs an overhaul, and they agree that Nalcor needs to be reined in. Chess Crosby borrowed a line from Donald Trump, calling it the deep state. It's a phrase used to describe the paranoia that bureaucrats are subverting elected officials. Nalcor has the power and the knowledge, and the elected politicians obey. That is not democratic. It is not healthy for democracy. And what does Tony Wakeham think about that phrase? I don't disagree with Mr. Crosby's analysis of the NALCOR piece on the governance piece. I think that we truly need to look out how we appoint people to the board of NALCOR. They say this agreement comes because they're both part of the same party. But if they're so similar, why vote for one over the other? That goes back to defeating the Liberals in 2019. It comes down to leadership and the ability to attract candidates. Progressive Conservative voters will be asking themselves the question, which leadership candidate 
is most likely to be able to form the government. And that's one question where the candidates do have very different answers. The party members will decide at the end of April. Peter Cowan, CBC News, St. John's. Well, coming up in about 10 minutes, I'll be hitting the basketball court with Tony Wakem to try to hook him with some one-on-one -on -one questions. Now, you may not know it, but the longtime businessman and healthcare executive was once quite the force in the basketball world. Well, here's an update for you, and the smile says it all. Isaiah Porter had a fabulous time on his Disney cruise. We told you about Isaiah last month when the Children's Wish Foundation, CUPE, and Paradise Elementary made Isaiah's wish come true, a family Disney cruise. Oh. <laughs> The grade two student from Paradise is an active little boy, the class clown, disguising the fact his heart is only half the size it should be. He was only five days old when he had his first heart surgery and more followed. We've never treated him as a sick child, so he's always been involved, same as a normal child. Uh, we said we'd let him figure out his limitations, and to be honest, I don't know if he has any. And now, a dream come true trip full of happy memories. There are fouls in basketball and there are fouls in politics. Coming up, a little political one-on-one -on -one with Tony Wakeham.
Welcome back, everyone, and it's time for the what are you doing, Anthony? <laughs> well, that story about that woman in paradise, uh, it got me thinking. I was just trying to see if I want a cart. Nope, nothing. <laughs> oh, well, I found, uh, I found this abandoned near Ryan's desk where Carolyn's been working, so I should have known. Yeah, she goes and she orders a sandwich, and instead she ends up g being given a bag full of the winning parts of the contest. Yeah, Pat Murphy says the tabs were all torn from coffee cups, and each and every one of them appeared to be winners. Yes, um, she called Tim Hortons right away and explained that somebody gave her the wrong bag. She says there were probably thousands of dollars worth of food and beverage prizes in there. Wow. That's pretty good. That is good of honest. her. Very uh, honest. Uh, right? Yeah, we are all wondering how many people would have done that because, of course, she could have redeemed them all for free coffee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Certainly nice to know there are people like Pam Murphy out there. And by the way, for her uh, honesty, Tim's gave her a $40 gift card to enjoy. So nice. a bit of reward. <laughs> good on you. <ya. laughs> yeah, very nice. And now what's our reward in the weather? Well, you know, it's pretty good. I, good. I'm, I'm liking how tomorrow is looking and heading into the weekend. If you have any plans, if you're going to be doing any driving tomorrow or are you heading out on Saturday night, things mm -hmm. are looking pretty good Great. so far. So let's have a look. This is our weather on the way headlines. So we will have uh, the scatter scattered flurries kind of settling in for much of the province for the next couple of days. Flurries on and off. Saturday is looking pretty pleasant for Patty's day and uh, we do have a potential system moving in on Sunday. Uh, we don't really have any amounts yet. The, the models are kind of disagreeing on how that's going to look so we are keeping an eye on that for sure. Now there is a snowfall warning in effect for the Straits area from Lodge Bay down through Red Bay. That should be ending fairly soon though. Lots of wet snow there along the coast quite messy more accumulation as you head inland but that is moving away and on the island you can see some scattered flurries there throughout this evening maybe potential for a few showers on the Avalon and uh, some heavier snowfall here in Labrador overnight tonight so uh, yeah this is a uh, temperatures on the island uh, hovering around the freezing mark there winds not too bad coming from the southwest 30 to 50 kilometers an hour. As for accumulation in Labrador, some snow coming, but not a whole lot. Lab City, uh, Maine, looking at about 5 to 10 centimeters of snow overnight tonight. 5 centimeters in Happy Valley, Goose Bay, and that could turn into some freezing drizzle overnight as well. So this is how our Friday is looking. You can see those flurries are really kind of sticking around. So throughout the day, you could see those flurries off and on uh, for most areas of the province. Actually, St. John's is looking pretty good. There's a chance that uh, we could see uh, maybe a shower or two, but you can see here some cloud cover, but we could see some sunshine. There's that chance for uh, for some showers later in the afternoon. So overall, as we're heading into the weekend, it's looking good in the east. Temperature wise, a high of four degrees for the Avalon. It gets a little bit cooler as you head towards central. Chance of flurries there throughout the day. A high of two degrees pretty much across the board there uh, for central and as you head to the west coast a chance of a little bit more accumulation not a whole lot of maybe about two centimeters of snow throughout the day so just a little dusting of snow and you will get a break from all of those very high winds over the past few days, uh, southerly winds 20 to 40 uh, throughout the day there. And as you head up to the Straits area, pretty calm day, some snowfall coming down, chance of flurries, lovely in Cartwright with a high of one degree with a mix of sun and cloud. A bit more snow coming for the rest of Labrador, not a whole lot. Nain looking at about two to four centimeters coming to more, another five for Lab City. And uh, Makovic looking great uh, with a high of zero with a mix of sun and cloud. So here's a quick look at at uh, how Saturday is shaping up. You can see some more uh, flurries there in Labrador, but the island uh, Saturday morning is looking pretty clear. We will see some more flurries moving in throughout the day, uh, particularly on the west coast, but uh, in the east it is looking pretty good. So I'll have some more details on that a bit later. Anthony. Thanks, Carolyn. Well, we're going to focus some attention now on the second person to enter the PC leadership race, and that's Tony Wakeham. The former CEO of the Labrador Grenfell Health Authority loves basketball. He coached at the university, provincial, and Canada Games level, and he's in the NL Basketball Association Hall of Fame, both as a player and as a team builder. And so we decided to meet where it all started for him, and that's at the old gym at Memorial University, where I challenged him to a little political one-on-one. -on -one. 
All right, it's time for a little political one-on-one -on -one with Tony Wakeham. As you know, he wants to be leader of the Progressive Conservative Party and perhaps even Premier. Here's the game. If he sinks the shot, he gets an easy question. If he misses, he gets a tough one. There you go, Mr. Wakeham. <laughs> All right, Anthony. Okay, he drained it. So the question I've got for you, what's your favorite Newfoundland cuisine? Um, I would say uh, Fisher Brews. Okay, easy question. Let's take another shot. Denied! <laughs> Rejected. <laughs> All right. Tough question now. Muskrat Falls, you, if you were successful, you'll be going door to door. The electorate thinks the Conservative Party is to blame for this albatross that's tied around our necks. How are you going to explain it, and how are you going to explain higher electricity rates? Anthony, first of all, let me say that like every other Newfoundland and Labrador, I am extremely concerned about the rising cost of Muskrat Falls. You know, we do have an inquiry that's been, uh, or is going to start up very soon, and I look forward to that inquiry providing us with the, the facts about Muskrat Falls, not necessarily the rhetoric. There's mm -hmm. been lots of chatter, but I think it's very important for us to find out exactly how that project was sanctioned, Fair what enough. was the budget plan. But my question is about the electorate. They're very angry about this. Your party gave us this project. How are you going to how are well, you going to rebut that? The important thing for me, I believe the Liberal government has not been totally honest with people about what opportunities might be there to mitigate that. And okay. I look forward to them coming out before 2019 and the election and talking about that. All right, I look forward to you taking the next shot. Let's <laughs> see how it goes. <laughs> Rejected once again. <laughs> All right, you know what's wrong with our healthcare system. Um, many of the outcomes are below the national average. You have firsthand experience. Doctors don't seem to want anything to, whenever someone tries to change it, doctors say no, reform somewhere else. The nurses say no, reform somewhere else. What would your approach be to actually fixing our healthcare system? You're absolutely right, Anthony. Everybody wants change, but nobody wants to change. Yep. So I really think- Everybody wants to go to paradise, but nobody wants to die. Right. So let's talk about, first of all, not talking about the providers, and let's talk about the actual people. Let's talk about the 500,000 of us that are here and what our needs are. I think we have enough data, enough evidence, but we need to go back out into the regions, into people where they live in their communities and talk about their health status. And then let's talk about what they need. All right, time for your next shot. Go in. Okay, you drained it. <laughs> That was a beautiful shot. <laughs> All right, so you get an easy question. Saved by the bill. You get, a, you get an easy question this time. Dog guy, cat guy? Oh, dog guy. Why? I just love big dogs. I used to have a golden retriever, and uh, I used to tease my family that I was going to change the dog's name to Walmart because when I'd come home in the evening, the dog was there to greet me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, time for another shot. <laughs> Oh, uh, close, uh, but no cigar. All right, tough question. You want to be leader of the Conservative Party. You have almost no real political experience. Why do you think you're ready for the job? Well, I've been around pol politicians all my life. I've been well, that's in not the same as political experience. No, but I've seen the good and the not so good in politicians. And so I know my way. I've been, <coughs> excuse me, made presentations at Treasury Board. I've been involved in presentations of the cabinet. I've been involved in presentations of the premier. I know exactly how the inner sanctum of government works. Last shot. Okay. All right, nice shot. All right, Mr. Wakeham, your last question. And again, it goes in the easy category. What's your favorite music? My favorite music would have to be jazz and really? blues. I just think it's, it speaks to the Speaks to the soul of people. It's the right color for your party. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good point. No, I just I like the, I like the feel of it. I like the fact that you can get into it. Well, it's been good getting to know a bit about you and having you answer some of the big questions in politics. Thank you very much and Thank good you. luck. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Bye. <laughs> you had hard. him sweating there. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. But uh, he was a bit nervous at points. But anyway, it was good of him to play along. And uh, it was funny when we first got there. He said, "I haven't done this, Anthony, in 20 years or years and years." And he sank a shot from like, outside the three-point line. And then, as he was warming up, a little less successful, but uh, yeah. interesting, interesting way to sort of meet him. It and certainly was. Uh, you get a real look at the personal side mm -hmm. behind the public candidate, and right. of course, 
We did the same thing with Chess Crosby, That's of course, right. the other candidate back in the fall. Just look. Went to India and studied yoga. Mm -hmm. uh, and do you were, still practice yoga? Absolutely. For over, over 30 years now, I've been a student of yoga. I, I like pranks. Mm -hmm. um, I own a moose suit, for example. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's Carolyn, of course. You could hear Carolyn's voice. That moose suit when uh, Carolyn visited Chess Crosby at his boyhood home in Portugal Cove, St. Phillips, to talk about what life is like when he was not in the courtroom practicing law. <laughs> yeah, a real behind-the-scenes look at uh, the people who want to lead the PC party. Mm -hmm. And everyone will know who that winner is April the 28th. Still want to see chess in those yoga pants. <laughs> to other news now, to Cornerbrook, uh, where there was an emotionally charged court hearing today. Nicholas Decker from Rocky Harbor was sentenced for his role in a fatal accident that the judge says was caused by Decker being drunk while driving. Although that wasn't the sentence that he faced. Here now is Colleen Connors explains. It was an extremely emotional day in this courtroom in Supreme Court in Cornerbrook. Nicholas Decker faces serious jail time for something the judge says happens all too often. Someone is impaired, gets behind the wheel, and seriously affects the lives of those passengers. Decker initially faced seven charges, including dangerous driving causing death. He was driving near St. Paul's on the Northern Peninsula in August of 2016 when he lost control of the vehicle. The crash killed his 20-year-old friend David White and seriously injured two other people. Today in court, Decker was sentenced only on two of the charges, both involved refusing a breathalyzer. His lawyer says the other charges weren't pursued. In our discussions with the Crown and our review of the file and uh, the evidence supporting all the charges, it was determined that those would be uh, the two that uh, the Crown offered to go with and that we agreed with. In sentencing Decker on those charges, Justice Brian Fury didn't hold back. Decker cried nonstop as Fury said drunk driving is something that happens all too often. The judge said Decker was clearly drunk at the accident scene. Police reported that he smelled of alcohol and that he stumbled and refused the breathalyzer. But the judge went on to say that since the incident, Decker has shown signs of a stable home and feels deep remorse for the accident. His lawyer agrees. Not a day goes by when he doesn't think about uh, what happened and the death of his friend. Um, in fact, he named his son, who was born after the accident, after uh, David, the uh, victim in this case. In the end, the judge sentenced Decker to two years less a day, something that upset his family, who were in the courtroom. David White's family wasn't there today. Decker's lawyer, Robbie Ash, indicated that Decker may be available for parole after serving about two-thirds of his sentence. Ash also says that Decker still thinks and talks about David, David White, every day. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Corner Brook. I used to be angry about it. I used to resent the world, resent society, because so all the people downtown there? in the nights, they'd walk on past with their buddies going to get drinks at the bar. How could you not know that we were children, right?
They were cases that shocked the province a decade ago. A child pornography operation in the basement of a pizza place and a grown man pimping out two children on the Supreme Court steps. Once the cases were done, the media moved on, but some young women were left reeling, including a 14-year-old girl who fell victim to both. Ryan Cook brings you this exclusive story, but first a warning, the details of this story are disturbing and not appropriate for young children. I used to be angry about it. I used to resent the world, resent society, because all the people downtown in the nights, they'd walk on past with their buddies going to get drinks at the bar. How could you not know that we were children, right? When you've been forced to do things that make your skin crawl, how long does it take to heal, to kill the monsters in your past, and can you ever live a normal life again? She's had these questions for 12 years. She lives without electricity, without running water, and without her daughter. At 26 years old, she is the face of child exploitation and its damage. But we can't show you her face, and we can't tell you her name either. The two women you'll meet in this story first approached CBC News in November of 2016. They wanted their stories told and their faces on TV, but the law had other ideas. The women signed affidavits. They gave full consent. But after CBC lawyers spent months in court, a judge upheld a publication ban concealing their identities. A publication ban has never been overturned for a victim of child pornography and these women will not be the first. And so, we'll call her Phoebe. I don't want to be the girl hiding behind the shadows of her past. I want to be the survivor who stands up and faces her past. It's the year 2003 and Phoebe is 12 years old, but she doesn't want anyone to know her age. She's about to sell her body to a grown man outside of the Supreme Court in St. John's and she can never forget her first time. I was so nervous, and I, I was almost to the point of overdosing on cocaine. I remember screaming as he pushed my face down into his back seat, just begging for him to stop, begging for it to be over. It was the longest 20 minutes of my life. As a child, you cannot consent to any of what I went through. It wasn't my fault. I didn't ask for any of it. She was born in Conception Bay South, raised in a happy family at first, but things change. Families fall apart, children rebel. Phoebe was taken from her home and placed in foster care at the age of 10. The abuse begins. There was one foster home. The wife would go to sleep and the husband would get up and molest us, you know? And you're afraid to tell your social worker. You're afraid to tell the police, your, your guidance counselor, right? And the, that they won't believe you. Looking to escape the assault, Phoebe turns to the streets, but there she finds the terror only amplifies. Sources have told CBC involved about in investigating and making child pornography ranged this from is 13 the sort of thing to 16. Young people should never be exposed to. Big Bite Pizza it was a scary place, and there was times that I was homeless, and I had to do pictures just for food. Street kids and sex workers gravitate towards Big Bite Pizza on Water Street. Minaj Shablak, a Kuwaiti immigrant, had a lust for young girls, and he had a Sony digital camera. We'd sit down in the restaurant part until he waved us back, which was normally when customers left. And then we'd go in the back or down in the basement, and even up in the food processing area where they'd have the prep table and everything like that. And uh, 
he'd grab out his camera and he'd tell you what way to pose and he'd always say he'd do it from the neck down as not to have faces involved because he knew we were all children. But Shablak is not her most feared predator. That title belongs to Sean Newman, her 33-year-old pimp. A mentally unstable man with violent tendencies, her protector, but also her worst nightmare. He just gained my trust and, you know, told me everything would be okay. He told me he'd be my friend and he loved me and cared for me and I, uh, I believed him. What was that process like? You know, where, where did this happen? Um, it happened downtown in front of the courthouse, actually. Um, that was the one spot he always put me. And he'd have customers lined up at first. And so I'd just go with them, do as they said, because that's what he told me to do. And then I had to bring the money back and put it in the console in his vehicle. And we'd go to a few hits of crack and he'd put me back out there. These tricks were often violent, grown men with dangerous desires. The one I remember is getting tied to a tree and beaten and then left there. And my friend found me. How old were you then? I was probably 12, 13. How does a 12-year-old process that in their mind? You know, how do you, how do you reason with why this is happening to you? Drugs. You use drugs to help cover up your emotions and how you're feeling and help you forget. Chemical relief, one of many things Phoebe shared with her friend. You'll meet her after the break. Welcome back to Here and Now. 
Tonight, we're telling the stories of two survivors of child exploitation, young women who wanted to break their silence and use their real names, but a court would not lift the publication ban. Their goals are twofold, to prove they are survivors and to possibly help others who may be struggling. Here's part two of Ryan Cook's exclusive story, and again, a warning that the subject matter is not appropriate for young children. Maynard Shablock ran a pizza shop in St. John's, but it was so much more than that. He gave jobs to young girls living on the streets with troubled lives. But Maynard Shablock was no saint. This is Sarah. During a period of homelessness at 15 years of age, she got a job at Big Bite Pizza. That's when she was approached by Shablock. He wanted her to pose naked in the store. Homeless and desperate, Sarah did it. It had a whole impact on the rest of my life. It's just something that I never got over. You never get over the humiliation or the guilt, the shame, and you always feel like it's your fault. I ended up on drugs for years, for I think it was like eight years or something after that on heavy drugs and in and out of really abusive relationships. It really affected everything I did. It affected who I was. Minaj Shablak could not keep it a secret. He pleaded guilty and served 11 months for photographing six underage girls. Both women say there was no follow-up after, no help offered to them after they helped put away their predator. They just kind of threw us to the curb. And I found that uh, really difficult, especially once I got older. There was no, no counseling, no programs offered. We were just left in whatever situation we were in in the beginning. What does that do for your, your self-confidence? It, um, it makes you feel like nobody cares about you and that you're not worth anything. And for a long time, I felt like I was worthless. Things got worse when Sarah turned to needles. There were nine or 10 overdoses in a short period of time, waking up kicking, punching, and clawing at the people who were trying to save her life. Just knowing that I almost died and waking up and not knowing who I was or where I was or if I had someone with me not knowing who they were and not being able to speak, not knowing how to speak. It was an extremely scary situation. And I guess with everything that had happened to me in the past, the first thing that I would think about was that I was being raped. The memories are all too much for Phoebe some days. She rarely leaves her house, which is hard when the winter comes. She moves her bed into the living room next to the wood stove but there's a different kind of cold running through her frail bones. You just get tired of the nightmares and flashbacks, and you just want it all to stop. And a lot of times I used to just cut just to be able to feel pain and see my own blood to know I was, I was an actual person, you know? not this ice-cold skeleton that I feel like. Self-destruction is a theme Sarah is all too familiar with. But after hitting rock bottom and losing her son, Sarah got on track. She was accepted to Memorial University and began working towards a degree. But then, a few months into sobriety, she broke. It was a 14-hour relapse, and I ended up in the hospital after having a heart attack. A cocaine-induced heart attack. She nearly lost everything and knew it had to be her last relapse. And it was. Today, Sarah is one semester away from her degree. She lives a full life with her partner, and she got her son back. I'm so scared that um, he's going to end up going down the same road that I did. You know, all I can do is do my best to prevent that from happening and be the best mother I can be so that he, way he doesn't 
had a need to go out and use drugs. Phoebe knows how hard it is to be a mom with the memories of exploitation. Her daughter isn't here. The little girl stays with her grandmother. She's, she's my rock. She's a wonderful little girl who don't, she don't know about her mommy's past, but she know mommy's not around a lot. And I believe that if someone would have seen the warning signs, the police, the social workers, anybody, I believe that my, my daughter would have the best mom she deserves, as where now she don't. Phoebe has been sober since the Newman trial in 2007. Instead of going to prison, Sean Newman was found dead on the day his appeal was denied. Phoebe remembers feeling relief. Sean Newman could not control her anymore. Today, she's trying to heal. She's trying to kill those monsters in her past. And most importantly, she's trying not to hurt herself anymore. In her frail bones, there's a feeling fighting against the cold, a feeling that she has work to do. I, I've had many attempts and for some reason I'm still here and I believe it's to get my story out and even if I can just change one girl's life, that means the most to me. It means that what I went through wasn't for nothing. community and the, the local construction community, I guess, come together in a, in a way that I've never seen before. The backstory of how a local musical got its unique set. Okay then, let's meet our young athlete of this day. Here we're giving a shout out to Keenan Keynes, 12-year-old Keenan, 
is a hockey player and just loves the game. Right, he plays left wing, good form there, with uh, a team that Debbie really likes the name of, the <laughs> Straits Rifters. Well, keep your stick on the ice, Keenan. You are today's Young Athlete of the Day. The weather update is brought to you by Bell Tone Hearing Service St. John's, helping the world hear better. All right, before we get to the weather uh, with Carolyn, here's a question. Just who's watching who? Take a look at this video. See what you think. And thanks to Tanya Pelly for sharing this trail camera video taken near Beachside. It looks like the moose knew somebody was watching. Wait, there it is. Yeah. Take a picture. It'll last longer. There you go. I wonder what caught... Yes. The attention of the yeah. moose there. Certainly. Can I help you? <laughs> Hopefully it wasn't, the person wasn't as close yeah. as it looked like. Now, you oh. may recognize this face. We showed you a video of Oliver the horse back in September playing with a broom. Mm -hmm. And here's another of his favorite hobbies, playing with <laughs> Ellie the Doberman. According to Oral Jestikin, who shared this video, the two animals are the best of friends. Oh, Aww. that is adorable. <laughs> I just got to find a way to work the moose in there. <laughs> That's so sweet. Like it should be a kid's storybook. That's nice. Look, <laughs> I'm scratching his head <laughs> or her head. <laughs> yeah, great. Nice. Thanks for uh, sharing that video. That's cute, <laughs> very cute. Yeah. Well, we had some nice temperatures uh, on the island today in a lot of places. I thought I would start there. Uh, okay. Pretty much everywhere above zero today and some more uh, decent temperatures coming uh, tomorrow. So here's a look at the, the highs. A hot spot today, Stephenville got up to seven degrees, four degrees in St. John's, Badger six degrees, seven in Deer Lake. So uh, yeah, some, some decent temperatures today. Things are warming up a bit. I just wanted to mention the snowfall warning that's still in effect for the uh, Lodge Bay to Red Bay area, Port Hope Simpson. That should be ending sometime uh, soon. A lot of wet snow along the coastline there and a bit more accumulation as you move inland. So it's a bit of a mess up there uh, this evening. So here's a look at uh, your Friday starting in the morning. Pretty nice day shaping up actually uh, for much of the province. We're, we're going to be getting a lot of these scattered flurries that I mentioned earlier throughout the day. So it'll be flurries on and off throughout the day. Uh, at around four o'clock, we're looking at about three degrees in St. John's and a bit more snowfall there in Labrador and along the West Coast. But overall, it's looking like a nice day. Mostly we're looking at sun and cloud with a chance of, uh, you know, a few showers here, a chance of some flurries in Central and about two centimeters of snow there on the West Coast. A little bit more snow coming down in Labrador, looking nice along the coast here. Bukovic zero as a high tomorrow with some sun and cloud. Cloud, about another five centimeters of snow coming for Lab City tomorrow. So as we get into tomorrow night, Friday night, as we're heading into the weekend, you can see all of these uh, flurries are just everywhere. So yeah, it's going to be a lot of on and off with, with that flurry action uh, Saturday morning. A lot of cloud cover, but not uh, not a whole lot there in terms of flurries. But we will see a little bit more developing throughout the day there on the West Coast Saturday at 11 a.m. And also here in the east uh, throughout the day, we could see some flurries uh, and along the west. So, yeah, it's kind of that no big systems or anything, but uh, we'll see off and on flurries. So, yes, chance of flurries there for central and the east. Temperatures not too bad around the freezing mark, a little bit cooler in the west there and uh, still those flurries in Labrador temperatures much cooler minus 11 as the high for lab west. Now for Sunday, this is what we're keeping our eye on. The models are kind of disagreeing about what this system is going to bring. So we see the swirling around there and then Sunday morning it'll come down, uh, start hitting Labrador and uh, the island. So right now we're looking at a day of flurries. It could develop into something more. We'll be as I say, keeping our eye on that. So for now, we're saying a chance of flurries for the island and as well for Labrador. So yeah, here's your Patty's day. Not too bad chance of flurries. As I mentioned, things, uh, the flurries sticking around for a few days after that, but by the, uh, uh, the end of the week there, we're looking at a bit of clearing, hopefully, as well for Labrador as we head into Wednesday and Thursday, things uh, will start to clear off a bit.
Thanks very much, Carolyn. Well, you're an aspiring artist chasing your dreams. You want to stay true to yourself, but you still need to pay the rent. Mm -hmm. That is one of the themes in the Pulitzer Prize and Tony Award winning musical Rent. That opens tonight at the Arts and Culture Center in St. John's. Yeah, Tada Productions director Terry Andrews says it's a difficult show to pull off from the singing and the dancing to building the set. And for the set, a unique partnership was born between Tada, the theater company, and Roth Loxton, an industrial contractor that works in the oil and gas sector. In order to get the, the industrial feel of where they were living, uh, we couldn't go with traditional wooden sets or anything. We wanted to have uh, structural steel in it. And we were able to put corporate par partnerships in place that allowed us to be able to visualize it the way that has always been in my head. And we also asked them to help us create two code sets uh, with railings and so on that people could get up and dance on and would meet all the codes. So they were the experts and they said, yeah, we're on. I just want to say I'm sorry for the way Forget it. I blew up. Can I make it up to you? No. Dinner party? That'll do. Hey, lover boy, cutie pie, you steal my client, you die. You didn't miss me, you won't miss her. You'll never lack for customers. Protest is on. That's my coat. Conceptually, that was the, probably the biggest thing first. That's how we're going to make this thing work with the skill sets that we've got at Roth Loxon uh, to meet the, the requirements of the local arts community. So it was a good, uh, it was a good learning experience. It uh, doubles us a number of different set pieces throughout the show, and it's going to be, uh, I'd say, the you know the, the highlight of uh, this, at least the set pieces in the show when we have folks dancing on it, dancing, singing on it, uh, cavorting in a number of different ways. But you got to come see the show to see it. Joanne, which way to the stage? Show. Ooh, production, that's pretty impressive. A construction company and a theater company coming together for something like that. Now, if you're interested in seeing it firsthand, tickets are available through the Arts and Culture Center box office. Show runs just three nights from now through Saturday. Well, in another arts-related story, a pioneer of Newfoundland and Labrador cinema has passed away. Okay, go. Mike Jones was a leading light among the very first generation of filmmakers from this province. He directed The Adventure of Faustus Bidgood, the first film produced entirely in this province with an all-local cast and crew. Jones worked alongside future stars such as siblings Kathy and Andy Jones, actors Bob Joy, Tommy Sexton and producer Paul Pope. And Jones was also founding president of the Newfoundland Independent Filmmakers Cooperative or NIFCO. Today, a statement from NIFCO called Jones a visionary who helped lay the groundwork for the province's thriving film community. Mike Jones was 74. In other news now from Florida, there is word that several people are believed dead following a pedestrian bridge collapse in that state. First responders raced to the scene around 3.30 hour time and could be seen tending to victims. At least eight vehicles were crushed in the collapse. So far, there are three confirmed fatalities. The footbridge stretched across a busy street on the Florida International University campus in Miami. It was installed on Saturday.
here's a beautiful sunset, our viewer picture of the day. Where was this photo taken? Uh, somebody's dick, apparently. <laughs> Somebody with a gorgeous view. Wow. <laughs> it is lovely. I'll tell you where this was shot right after the break. Welcome back, everyone. Well, one of the most grueling races on Earth, the Iditarod, has come to an end with the winner crossing the finish line after more than 1,600 kilometers. Well, this year's edition saw a Norwegian musher come out on top after nine days and 12 hours of sledding through the Alaskan wilderness. Runner-up honors went to a French sledder who apparently lost his lead in the final portion of the race by making a wrong turn. That is grueling. They didn't yes. have, they didn't have machines like no. Kane's Quest. That uh, it's a lot of work. A lot. Sixteen hundred kilometers. Uh huh. Nine well, days. The French guy, the Norwegian guy. No one gives credit to the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> that is a very good point. <laughs> they are the athletes for sure. <laughs> Anyway, we're curious about that gorgeous yeah, picture. It's a lovely picture. This was taken this morning. Whoa. Gorgeous uh, sunrise that was taken uh, on uh, Bellevue Beach. Oh, oh. lovely. Yeah. yeah. Makes so sense. thank you very much to Annabelle Murray for sending that into Ryan's Facebook page. I will oh. bet that Annabelle has some nice barbecues. <laughs> <laughs> what a place to yeah. wake up and look out over that. The colors. The orange and the ice. Nice contrast. Mm -hmm. Nice Gorgeous. in the summer, nice yeah. in the winter. Yeah. Almost thanks. looks warm. <laughs> yeah. warm thanks colors. so much for sending that along and thanks to you for being with us. Mm -hmm. See you tomorrow. Good night. Bye now.